In today's session at Medical Sciences, we want to discuss about secondary hemostasis. Hemostasis is the stopping of blood flow after an injury, or what we call a stopping of bleeding. And hemostasis is divided into three. That is primary hemostasis, secondary hemostasis, and fibrinolysis. So but in today's session, we want to focus on secondary hemostasis, which is known as coagulation. Coagulation is the one whereby we form fibrin mesh that, strengthen, that strengthens the product of primary hemostasis, which is the platelet plug. And we always remind you to subscribe, share your comments, and like the video. So secondary hemostasis, which we are calling coagulation cascade, we can even call it coagulation is a cascade of events. So it is coagulation cascade. So we are going to see cascade of events whereby factors which are produced in inactive form, or we can call them zymogens, are activated. And among the factors we shall see, we shall see factor one, which is known as fibrinogen. We shall see factor two, which is which is known as prothrombin. Then we have factor three, which is tissue factor thromboplastin. Tissue factor thromboplastin. Then we have calcium as factor four. Factor four is calcium. Then we have factor five, which is labile factor. This is labile factor. Then factor seven is a stable factor, known as a stable factor. Then this is anti-hemophilic. Anti-hemophilic is number factor eight, is known as anti-hemophilic factor. Then factor nine is known as Christmas. Why? Because it was first discovered in a man called Christmas. Then we have another factor called Stuart Plower. Stuart Prower is number 10. Stuart Prower factor. Then this is number 11, which is known as plasma thromboplastin ascendant. Plasma thromboplastin. Thromboplastin ascendant. Then factor 12 is known as Hegman factor. Then this one, 13, is fibrin stabilizing factor. Or you can call it fibrinase. You can call it fibrinase. And factor 12, which is Hegman, you can call it contact factor. Because it is, it is triggered by contact surface. Then the last one is high molecular weight kininogen. And precalicrine. So 13 factors plus high molecular weight kininogen and precalicrine are the one that plays a big role in the hemostasis, what we are calling secondary hemostasis, known as coagulation. Whereby these all of them are coagulation factors. And these coagulation factors, they are produced in inactive form and they need to be first activated before they do their function. And we're going to see how different factors play a big role in activating others via different pathways in secondary hemostasis. But before we go ahead, I will tell you that factor, factor two, factor seven, factor eight, nine, and 10 are vitamin K dependent. Factor two, Seven, nine, we have factor two, factor seven, factor eight, nine and 10 being vitamin K dependent factors. So when someone has a deficiency of vitamin K, we see them not being produced and they can affect 
clotting of blood. So these are introduction to the coagulation factors which are produced in inactive form. Now, now what we want to talk about is different pathways under coagulation. And coagulation occurs in two ways, that is intrinsic and extrinsic. We have intrinsic pathway and extrinsic. So we are going to discuss these two pathways, extrinsic pathway and intrinsic pathway. And we shall see where they meet to join the common pathway and we are going to see how are they activated. For example, intrinsic pathway is activated by contact surface. Contact surface is the one that activates intrinsic. Intrinsic means the factors that activate it are within the vessels. So we're going to see contact surface like glass, glass, then allergic acid, then we, ha we normally have kaolin. Any negatively charged substance or surface can activate the intrinsic, whereby this contact surface, they, are, they activate factor 12, which we know as Hegman factor, into activated Hegman factor. So uh, let us more uh, denote for activated factor. And we're going to see that this contact surface like glass, allergic acid, and cowering, which are acting as contact surfaces, they do not activate enough of factor 12. So we are going to see also this contact surface activating precalicrine. To calicrine. And this calicrine formed also activates more of the factor 12, activated factor 12 in the presence of high molecular weight kininogen. So we are saying that the contact surface activates little of the factor 12. So we need also the interplay of pre calicrine being converted to calicrine. And then calicrine in the presence of a factor of high molecular weight kininogen is able to activate enough factor 12. And this activated factor 12 in combination with the contact surface together with the calicrine and high molecular weight kininogen, they are the one that go and activates factor 11. And factor 11 is activated, becomes activated still in the presence of high molecular weight kininogen. Then after getting activated factor 11, factor 11 which is activated is able to activate factor 9. It skips factor 10 and activates factor 9. And this activation of factor 9 occurs in the presence of activated 11. We called it a cascade why one step leads to the other. So if a factor is activated, it activates the other. So if we have 11 which is activated, it also goes and activates 9 into activated factor. And this one occurs in the presence of platelet phospholipid, platelet phospholipid and calicia. Then we are going to see the factor 9 which is activated, activating factor 10 to activated, to activated factor 10. And this 9 works hand in hand with factor 8, activated factor 8 in the presence of calcium and platelet phospholipids. So these four events, we are seeing factor 9 activated, calcium, which is factor 4, then factor 8 activated, and platelet phospholipid working together to activate factor 10 into activated 10. And this is the first step in coagulation. Because the first step in coagulation is activation of factor 10. The second step is conversion of prothrombin to thrombin 
And step three is conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. So we are seeing as the first step, which is conversion of factor 10 to activated factor 10 by the interprov 11, 12, 11, and 9 in the presence of also factor 8, activating factor 10, which is the meeting point or what we call the trigger of the common pathway. And we are going to see that activated factor 10 is the one that comes and activates factor 2, which is prothrombin. We are going to see it activating prothrombin to thrombin. This is factor 2, and this is activated factor 2. In the presence of factor 10, then together with factor 5, then plus calcium and platelet phospholipids. They are the one that activates prothrombin to thrombin, whereby prothrombin is factor 2. So this is step number, this was step number 1, step number 2, which is conversion of prothrombin to thrombin in the presence of activated factor 10, factor 5, calcium and platelet phosphoripid. And whenever we have activated factor 10, fact, uh, prothrombin, which is factor 2, this prothrombin is able also to initiate the conversion of fibrinogen, whereby fibrinogen, which is factor 1, is also activated or cleaved to fibrin. And this fibrin is an unstable mesh, is unstable. So what activates fibrinogen to fibrin or converts, which is step number three, because we are seeing in this coagulation, step number three is conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, which is a clot. But this clot, which is the first formed, is unstable. It cannot stabilize the cells at the injured site. So we need to stabilize this fibrinogen whereby we need the fibrin stabilizing factor to, to stabilize this fibrin. So here we form fibrin, which is, a which is a stable mesh. And what stabilizes the fibrin is factor 13. We shall see factor 13 being activated, being activated factor 13 activated and what activates factor 13 is thrombin so thrombin does two roles thrombin activates the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin at the same time he activates factor 13 activated factor 13 and the role of factor 13 is the one that stabilizes the fibrin and stable fibrin mesh into a stable fibrin mesh so we are going to see that at the end, at the long run, we are producing a network of mesh. And this mesh is the one that stabilizes the platelet plug at the injured site, stopping blood from crotting. So this is what we know as intrinsic pathway. And in this intrinsic pathway, we have seen it in three steps, whereby step number one is activation of factor 10 whereby activation of factor 10, we have seen starting from the contact surface, factor 12, then 11, then 9, and then 9 activating 10 in presence of calcium, then factor 8 and platelet phospholipid. Then the second step was conversion of prothrombin to thrombin in the presence of activated factor 10, factor 5, calcium and platelet phosphoripid. And then we have seen step number three, which is the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And this conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, which is factor one, is activated by thrombin. And then this unstable fibrin mesh formed is stabilized by activation of factor 13, which is a fibrin stabilizing factor in the presence of thrombin form activated form, which stabilizes fibrin 
to fibrin mesh, which is stable and can stop blood from clotting. And we shall see at the long run that the intrinsic pathway, so we are seeing this is the intrinsic, then this one is the common pathway. This is the common pathway, and we call it common pathway because both intrinsic and extrinsic meet at factor 10. So when I couple this together with the common pathway, I form what we call intrinsic, and this intrinsic pathway is measured by a test known as activated partial thrombin time, what we call APTT. So lastly, after knowing how intrinsic factor occurs, we can now talk about extrinsic pathway. And extrinsic is very nice because it has one step, and what triggers intrinsic is injury to the blood vessels. Whenever there is injury to the blood vessels, or maybe what we can call trauma, so any damage to the blood vessels or to the endothelium of the blood vessels. So whenever there is an injury or damage, we see these blood vessels, the endothelial, releasing what we call tissue factor. We release tissue factor. And this tissue factor is known as factor 3. We call it tissue factor thromboplastin. And this tissue factor is the one that activates the stable factor, which is factor 7, to activated factor 7. So we are seeing tissue factor due to the, which is released by the lining of the blood vessels due to the damage, activating factor 7 activated factor 7 in the presence of calcium. We see calcium doing a great lore to activate this factor into activated factor 7. And activated factor 7 is the one that also comes and activates factor 10. So factor 10 under extrinsic pathway is activated by factor 7 activated. Is the one that activates. So it meets the intrinsic at the common pathway, what is, which is factor 10. So all of them aim at activating factor 10, which is always the fastest step. So we saw in the intrinsic, factor 9 activated calcium, factor 8 and platelet phospholipid is activating factor 10. But now we are seeing in the extrinsic pathway, the activated 7 together with the calcium, and the phospholipid is playing a role of activating factor 10. So if I have this one in the presence of phospholipids and factor 7 activated, we are able to convert inactive factor 10 to activated factor 10, and then they join the common pathway, whereby the next step will be conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, and also conversion of fibrinogen fibrin which is unstable and is stabilized by factor 13 to stable mesh which can stop blood from clotting. So one thing I want you to note is that these cascades occur in three steps which is the first step is activation of factor 10 and is the only one that differ between intrinsic and extrinsic. And we have seen intrinsic is triggered by contact surface whereas extrinsic is, is triggered by damage to the blood vessels. And we have seen the first factor in intrinsic is, is 12, then followed by 11, followed by 9, 9 in the presence of 10, and calcium activating factor 10. But in, in extrinsic is that when there is an injury, tissue factor activates factor 7 in the presence of calcium and phospholipids, still also activating factor 10 which is the first step in the coagulation. The second step, which is conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Then the last one, fibrinogen to fibrin. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you have learned about these cascades. And always remember to subscribe and share your comments with us. Mm -hmm.